The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 128. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who walk in his ways. You will eat the fruit of your labor. Blessings and prosperity will be yours. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your sons will be like olive shoots round your table. Thus is the blessed man, is the blessed man who fears the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion all the days of your life. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem and may you live to see your children's children. Peace upon Israel. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, so it is now and will be forever. Amen. Good morning. Our first leading this morning is from Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 12. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 12. If you're there, I'll read. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity who falls and has no one to help them. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though, may, may one, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Good morning, church. Praise God. Our second reading is from 1 Corinthians. Uh, chapter 12, verse 20 to 25. First Corinthians, uh, chapter 12, verse 20 to 25. And I read, As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The, eyes, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indecipherable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. Well, our presentable parts need to while our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. This is the word of the God. Because of granting us this opportunity, even to come to worship you, to praise you, and now to hear your word. Reach us, my Father, King of all glory, at our very hearts. Make us understand your word. Reveal your mysteries unto us. Make, my Father, the unknown known to us, so that, my Father, you may live as per your will. This is my humble prayer in Jesus' name. Today, let us remain studying. Let us remain studying, please. Praise be to God. What I'm about to say will even challenge you for sitting down that fast. Praise be to God. I have a genuine concern, but let me start with a, a good observation. Thank you, our choir, because of two things. As I've told you, myself, I'm not posted in any parish. I'm just a member of the church with no position but with passion. And out of that, I've been going to various churches in this country. Like this week, we are starting um, traveling into four counties. And yet on Sunday, I'm supposed to be here to conclude. So I visited so many churches, actually over 1,000. But to be sincere, when I come to this church, our choir, that is where I hear the real choir. Praise be to God. No. 
There's a church somewhere that presented as a choir and I told them wacheni kutuchezea. Hiyo si choir. You know we differentiate choir and singing group. You know when you come here you can be the like our mothers what they have done. That one is a good singing group. But <laughs> so, <laughs> and I belong there. By the way, I'm even below because I don't have that voice. So I always tell people, even if I don't have that sweet voice, uh, at least I have a, a, a location in the Bible because the Bible says, make a joyful noise to the Lord. I belong to that class. I make a lot of noise, but joyful to the Lord. Praise be to God. So that is a positive ob observation. The concern that I have is that most of us, we came late today. So our altar men, you may be seated. Choir, automatically you are here, you be seated. Now listen to this. I want us to sit in a style. If you were here when the choir were leading us into procession, when they were leading us to come in, if you were already in church, see at you but we are already in, you were in to recupata uku. When we are coming in as a choir, with the, with the choir, have your seat. Is it true? Just give me a few minutes when, when studying I say something. Let me tell you. Let me give you a secret. Maybe you don't know. Every time we are starting a service, this is what we pray. Our Lord, we are grateful because of giving us a chance to assemble here, to praise and to worship you. Thank you because of the members that are already here. And also we pray for the members that are coming. God has turned their feet. Imagine that has been our prayer. Can you, can you imagine that when you are not on time, when the service is starting, you are already a prayer item to us? You know myself, I'm fearless. And I tell you the truth because the truth will set you free. <laughs> Praise be to God. Every time you are not here when you are starting the service, you are already a prayer item. And God, God never intended you to become a prayer item. We want prayer warriors in the church, not prayer items. Praise be to God. You know, I'm, I'm cautioning you with love. Uh, it is good to become a burden bearer and not to become a burden yourself. So every time you, you purpose to come to the house of God, always purpose to be here on time. And get this uh, illustration that every time you are going to a working places, you are bosses, them that are at our boss, even if you are your own boss. No one prays for you. Oh God, hasten the feet of my employee. Oh God, I come against every traffic around Kiabu Road. No one prays for you. But you always make it early and on time at your working places. So when you are coming to church, myself, even if I'm going, like now I've told you I'm going to four counties, I always keep time. Even if it is Meru, Ebu, Nyaururu, you can ask them. Every church I go, I've never been late. And that is me. So always let us try to keep time to the house of God. When you say that the service is 10, 10 is not getting in. 10 is when even the altar servants are already there. That is the 10 we mean. With a lot of love, please look unto that. God bless you. Have your seat. Hallelujah. Is that one okay? Oh, so don't make sure you don't disconnect from me when I'm teaching because I've said it with a lot of love and humility. And I really thank God to see all of you. One thing I've also noted is that this church is growing numerically. It is growing numerically. It is even growing spiritually. You are growing. You are growing. Growing and glowing. Either you are L. You have both. Praise be to God. I'm Joseph Washira. I'm born again this morning. I come from this great diocese of Mount Kenya South, and a Chidikonari called Lemuru, and a parish called Emmanuel Shinyanga, whereby we have been served by our able reverend uh, Jennifer Jerry Mogai, and I have our blessings everywhere I go to minister in this nation and also abroad when I do it online. I thank God because of being here the second time for this uh, series in the month of March, and them that were absent on Sunday when I was starting, and maybe you, have, you, you had no time 
to look at uh, at our YouTube channel because it is both in our the YouTube of the church and also my YouTube Evangelist Joseph Washira. That is where you can get all my teachings. And I know that most of you or some of you are not in. I understand what was going on. And maybe others, they had their own commitments. They did not turn up. But we started a very, very interesting topic and series on Sunday, whereby we say this year, the theme of the whole year in our diocese is divine settlement. And then we say it in this month, the specific month that we are in, the month of March, our theme is uh, settled in his resurrection. And now, to be precise, in our, in our series, in my teachings, from last Sunday to the coming Sunday, we, we are huddling or we are looking at a settling in stable families. Settling in stable families. And I started by saying that when we talk about families, it is not necessarily father, mother, and children. It can be father and mother alone. It can be mother and children. It can be father and children. It can be children alone. It can be a church family. It can be your working place. It can be your neighborhood. That is a family. And so we are looking at those people who team up, who live together, who have something in common, and we call it a family. Because in church, we have diversities. We don't belong to a certain category. So we cannot address that as if we are talking to families, them that are married. Because we know there are them that are widowed, there are them that are separated, there are them that are not married, there are them that are... Uh, what? Okay, whatever. Maybe, but you are not living together. But it is good to understand, whatever state you are in, you belong somewhere. There is somewhere you have a sense of belonging. So when we talk about settling in his resurrection in the month of March, in our church, we are teaching how to be settled in our families. And I started on Sunday and I said, I will divide this teaching into three categories because I have three Sundays here. And the first Sunday, I thought about being stable spiritually. We are talking about being settled in stable families. And the first category is being stable spiritually. And I said, for you as a family, to be stable spiritually, you need to connect with God. And I say it because we cannot ascend all the way to heaven to connect with God. We have a platform that we call the altar where we connect with God as a family. And our reading was from the book of First Samuel chapter 1, whereby we had a good example of the family of Elikana and the two wives, Penina and Hannah. And we realized that this family Despite the ups and downs, they had a spiritual background, they had a spiritual stability because they could connect with the altar annually. Every year, they could leave the Yalad of Ephraim and they could go to a place called Shiro to connect with the altar. And I started by saying that the altar of God is one, but I always categorize it into three, that we have the personal altar where you relate with God as a person individually like the case of Daniel in Daniel 6 and verse 10 and then we talked about family altar and this is our main interest family altar and we talked about Job chapter 1 and verse 5 where Job could call his sons and daughters and sacrifice for them on their behalf and he could pray over them that is a family altar and I challenged all of them that we are here on Sunday, that if you don't have a family altar at your home, you better start it now. It is good when a family prays together, whereby you have a time before going to bed or even before leaving to work in the morning, you have a time together as a family to, to pray. And you can even allocate duty to each and every member of the family. If it is the dad who has done it today, let the mother do it tomorrow, let the firstborn do it, you know, uh, the other day. And this is what happens in my own family. They are coming here on Sunday, and so we are going to see them. But we always make sure that we have raised an altar in our 
family. For you to be spiritually stable as a family, you need to have a personal altar, family altar, and then you have a corporate altar. Corporate altar, it is the one that we are in right now. And I thank God because at least it is working. Because I've seen already two families who have come to give thanks unto God. When you come here with your family to give thanks, you are connecting with this altar because it is a corporate altar. The difference between the personal altar, the family altar, and the corporate altar, the uniqueness with the corporate altar is that the corporate altar has got a spiritual authority. That is why Erikana could go all the way to Shiro because the man Eli, the priest Eli, was there at the altar. So, for your family to stabilize, we say it, you need to connect to the altar. And when you connect to the altar, number one, you get sanctification for you to stable spiritually. Kuna watu wanasubuagwa na maroho. Maroho ilitoka kwa damu yao, maroho ilitoka kwa watu wao, maneno ilitoka kwa watu. And when you feel you are tox, you are toxicated, you come to the altar as a family, as an individual, you are sanctified because the work of the altar is to sanctify you. We got that one from the book of Luke chapter 2 and verse 22, where Jesus was presented at the temple for sanctification, for cleansing. And also he got it from the book of Hebrews, chapter 10 and verse 22, whereby the Bible says that we approach the altar, we come with full assurance that God is able to cleanse our mind, to cleanse our guilt, and also to sprinkle our bodies with pure water. And then we say it, we come to the altar for us to be stable spiritually as a family, we come for supplication. This is where we come to pray. And I thank God because of our reverend, when he was praying for the first family that we are giving thanks, he said if there is even the second, the second, uh, our reverend praying for the reverend, they, they both said if there is any prayer in their heart, God, may you hear, because when you come to the altar, for you stabilize spiritually, then we supplicate before God. And number three, we said, when we come to the altar, for us to stabilize as a family, we need to offer sacrifices. Already we have seen one, that one of thanksgiving. Even when you are coming with 10%, you are stabilizing spiritually. You are stabilizing your working place. You are stabilizing your career. You are stabilizing your business. You are stabilizing everything concerns you through paying your tithe, free will offering, supporting the work of God, supporting your cell group. Whatever the sacrifice that you offer at the altar, you are stabilizing your family. And we said number four, we stabilize our family spiritually as we serve God as we serve God. And it is good to understand. And I told people, I challenged you on Sunday, them that were in, that God never intended any one of us to become a bench warmer in the church. God never expected any one of us to become a spectator in the house of God. He wants you to be a participant. God wants you to do something. And you know, every time I'm teaching leaders, like now I'll be having a seminar in Kirinyaga for leaders on Thursday, and every time I'm teaching leaders of the church, I always tell them when you serve God, God will always preserve you. God will always provide for you. God will always promote you. God will always usher you into his presence. God will release his power upon you because serving God is not in vain. So you stabilize as a family and that is why Joshua is saying in the book of Joshua 24 and verse 15, as for me and my family, we will serve God. When your family is serving God, it is stable. And it is good to ask yourself, you know, as a family, do we serve God? In what department, in what area, in what sector are we serving God? Like now you have an example. The, the, I don't know, but they are privileged to serve God. The chair ready for the choir and the husband, the chair for the kama. You can see when they go home and they start discussing how are the men faring. Oh, tough but good. How is the choir faring? No, because they are serving God, both of them. What about you? What about your family? Do you have a daughter serving? Do you have a father serving? Do you have a mom serving? Do you have a, sp a spouse serving God? Are you in any department of the church? 
The work of God is a lot. The Bible says it is plenty, but the laborers are few. So we are still, there is always a vacant in the house of God, in the vineyard for us to serve God. And when we serve God, he stabilizes our families. And finally we say, to stabilize spiritually as a family, we need a spiritual authority over us. That is why that family would come to the altar and recognize the spiritual authority. They come and give thanks. Some of us, we are very wayward. Although we are spiritual, we are wayward. We don't, we deviate so much. And we also toxify ourselves. When you go to various men of God, when you go to be prayed for by different men, it's like someone traveling to Kitale. There was a time I used to travel to Kitale, 2010-2011, and then we could buy some snacks at Nairobi from, from the bus stop. And then we could start traveling to Lemuru Kijabe, and then we would buy roasted maize. From there, we'd go to Gilgil, Toll Station, we would buy yogurt. And then you get to Nakuru, you are given a break of 30 minutes, take lunch, you, you, you eat some chapo or chipo, and then you proceed, you go to Eldoret, you buy something else. Ata ukifika kitare ubo na tubo, utajua nini ulikura. That's how some Christians are. Someone, someone prayed for you, someone prophesied for you, someone sat on you, someone did what? You know, it is too much. Settle on one spiritual authority. Let that authority, as the Bible says in Matthew 16 and verse 19, they have been given powers, the keys of the kingdom, that whatever they lose here, it is lost in heaven. Whatever they bind here, it is bound in heaven. And as I was telling mothers, in our decision, Larry, uh, as on Saturday, I was telling them at Gong, it is not, the anointing is not in the voice. The anointing is in the power of God, which is in that kraji, which is in that spiritual authority. See, kutisha kwa tuna sauti. Na kamea kira pepo. Na sabaratisha kira. No, no. Even if I say, the blessings of God Almighty. Come on, you are every day so cool. The blessings of God. You just believe. The kingdom of God is all about faith. It is all about faith. Even when we are, you are inviting him to pray over your car, don't say, now your mouth is key, come and a mahali. Where are you going You know, there are some people, you know, they just want someone who is so, I don't know, but very, like, brutal, you know, very harsh, very vibrant. I don't know how you measure anointing. Some of us, we are very cool, but anointed. Praise be to God. <laughs> we are not noisy, but we are very effective. Praise be to God. So stick to a spiritual authority. Don't have briefcase pastors. I call them briefcase pastors. And you can never submit other two authorities. You either submit one and you regret the other. So today we are getting into a second category whereby we, we want to be settled as families, you know, stable as a family. And the second category, after learning the spiritual stability, I want us to get to a second category, and that is why we did our readings from the book of Psalm. We got to understand the father, mother, and the children, Psalm number 20, 128, that, that was read for us. And then we get our first reading from the book of uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, from verse 9 to 12, and we are told about two are better than one. And then we, get, we got our second reading from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It was from verse 20 to 25. And we learned about the body parts and the unity. And so out of that, we get to our second category of settled uh, in stable families, which is social stability. Social stability. After being settled spiritually, you also need to be settled socially. As I told you, when you made your vertical, God you made your horizontal. That is why we started with spiritual stability, and now we are dealing with social stability. Some of us, we are so spiritual to a point of being so antisocial. Have you gotten that one? We are so spiritual to an extent of being so 
antisocial. When God created man, he created man as a social being. And for you to be stable as a family, then you need social network. No matter how spiritual you are, you need the social network. And it is there in the Bible. If you read Judges, chapter 18 and verse 7, we have a story of a certain city that was called Laish. Laish, Judges 18 and verse 7. And the Bible says that this city, it was prosperous. It lacked nothing. And the Bible says they had no relationship with anyone else. In fact, they were living far from the Sidonians. That is the description. They were prosperous. They were well-to-do people. But they disconnected with others. They were living far from other people. They had no social network. And the Bible says when a certain tribe, the tribe of Dan, when they are looking for settlement, they found these people who are prosperous, who lack nothing. The Bible says they realized they were so unsuspicious and so they attacked. If you read the same Judges 18, verse 27 and verse 28, the Bible will tell you that these people were attacked and the Yaseta, the Yaseta was captured and it was burnt. Simply because they had no relationship with other people. How can you be stable all alone? Even after God creating everything, he said it is not good for a man to be alone. Because he created man as a social being. God never intended you to be alone. Another instance it is the case of Naaman. If you read 2 Kings chapter 5 from verse 2 there. 2 Kings chapter 5 from verse 2. You realize Naaman and his wife, they had a house help. And after so many, you know, efforts, after a lot of effort to make sure that the man is healed because Naaman was leprous and it amounted into nothing, the Bible says, that this, man, this young girl approached the woman, the wife of the house, and he, he, she, she told the, the wife, if only my master would go to Israel, because he'll get a prophet there who would be able to heal his sickness. What if the woman was not in a good relationship with the house help? Some of our families, they are so unstable because of lack of social network. You don't relate well with your workers. You don't relate well with your spouse. You don't relate well with your children. And let me tell you, if they were harsh or unfair or mean with this house girl, they would never be sorted. At times I tell people, and it is good you, you get it, even your soldier, even your gate man, it is very wise to relate well with him. Do you know why? If you read the book of Esther, there was a time the king, I don't know whether it is Esther chapter 6 from verse 1. The Bible talks about a king who could not sleep and he took a book of chronicles, a book of remembrance, and he got to a page where a king was saved by a mere gate, gate man. He was saved by those people that we despise so much, some of us. And the Bible says, what was done to this man, to this gate man who saved the life of a king? Those people, you think they are nothing or they are less, they carry a lot of information. We have seen the house girl saving a whole general. Naman, we have seen a just a mere gate man saving uh, the king from those people who are planning to assassinate him. Who knows 
Whether those people you despise or those people you don't socialize with, those people you don't relate well with, they carry your destiny. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I'm also reminded, 1 Samuel chapter 30, it should be verse 11. 1 Samuel 30, 11. When David was in pursuit after the Amalekites burned down Zikirag, and then David was pursuing to recover even his two wives. He got to a place and met an Egyptian. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 30 and verse 11 that when they found an Egyptian, the Egyptian confessed that we were from the raid. Those, that Zikrag that was destroyed, it is us who did that. And the Bible says he told King David that we are the one who burnt that Zikrag, but my master abandoned me here because I was sick. And because he was sick, he had been there three days with nothing to eat and no water to drink. And the Bible says in the following verse that David commanded his people to feed this man and to quench him after he was fed and quenched. And he directed some of the people you despise, they hold your destiny, all they need is feeding. <laughs> So it happened in that case. And it is good to understand that we are meant to socialize. We are meant to have social network for us to be stable. Let me teach you three things and then we conclude. We come for the third category on Sunday. Number one, to, stable, to stabilize socially, you need love. Love. When I'm teaching couples, I always take that word love as an acronym. Love. And I always tell people, learn each other. Whether at home, at your working place, in your department, in a church like this one, in any setup that we call a family, learn each other. Learn each other. And let me tell you, you don't need necessarily to change a person, but you need to understand them. So unless you learn them, you can never understand them. When you relate with people socially, when your social network is good, you learn a lot of things. Can you work out on that love as an acronym and letter L, can you try to learn each other? Even as couples, every day is a learning day. In that department, every day is a learning day. In that neighborhood, every day is a learning, is a learning day. In that office, every day is a learning day. So can you learn each other? Let us all open up to each other. Some of the families are not stable. Some of working colleagues are not stable simply because they don't open up to each other. If you don't open up, how will I know I offended you? How will I know what is in your mind, what is in your heart? Can we purpose to open up to each other? If we are in love as a church, in love as a department, in love as a family, in love as a couple, can we learn each other and proceed to open up to each other? Letter V, can we value each other? And this value, I'll approach it in two dimensions. You respect each other. That is the value, this one side of the approach. Can we respect each other? If you, love, if you love someone, then you value them. You value them. You give them their value. You respect them. Value them. The way you talk to them. The, the way you handle their things. Can you value them? The other dimension of value is adding value to the other person. That is why we need this social network. Because I can add you value, you can add me value. 
And when I'm teaching about company, the company that you keep, I always tell people, if you are, if you are relating with someone who does not add you value, then you are in the wrong company. Because you need someone who will add you value or someone who you will add value. So can we value each other, respect each other, and grow each other? That is the way we add value. Add value to your husband. Add value to your wife. Add value to your department. Add value to the church. Add value to the office you are working in. Add value. By the way, it is said, make the place better than you found it. Leave the person better than you found him or her. And letter E, edit, edit. We are in, in computer era and we understand what is edit. You edit what is not needed. Meaning, you forget, you ignore, you overlook those things that does not please you. You focus on what is positive. Can you edit? There is so much trash in a person, but inside that trash, there can be treasure. Can you find something good about someone? Just edit. Edit. Don't judge one person or a certain person by just one thing that she did or maybe she failed to do. Can you edit? First Peter, I think it should be chapter 4 and verse 8. It, talk, it talks about love covers multitude of sin. So we learn to forgive each other. We learn to persevere each other because we are not perfect. So if we are to live socially right and stable, we must learn under this love, let us forgive each other, let us persevere one another. Because I'm not good, you are not good, but we can persevere each other. Number two, for us to stabilize socially, we need unity. Unity. Unity is working together. The Bible should be, it should be Genesis 11 and verse 6. There are these people who are in unity to build uh, the Babel Tower. And the Bible says, God himself came to look at what they were doing. And such a unity that it is even scaring the heavens. They are coming to watch what they are doing. And the Bible says, if they are united this much, there is nothing they plan to do that they cannot achieve. And because it was negative, then God confused them. God dismantled them. Because that unity was too much. And this is the unity we need back at home. The unity we need at our working places. The unity we need at leadership level. The, needed, the, uh, the unity we need in, a, in every department. The unity we need at our working places. We need people who are united. Because the Bible says two are better than one. And the Bible says that cord, that string, that is made of three cords... It is not easily broken. So we become more strong when we are united. And we need to remain united. By being united, I'll give you two things. Embrace each other. Embrace each other. If you are to be united, we must embrace each other. Romans 14, it should be verse 1. The Bible talks about them that are weak to be embraced by them that are strong. So in that family setup, in that office, in that church, in that department, in that neighborhood, can we learn to embrace each other? Kubatia mwenzako, ako na shida zake, rakini mkubatie, embrace that person as he is, as she is, embrace one another for you to remain United. And that is why even in football, we have different positions. We have the, that one who is marked number one, the goalkeeper. We have number two, the defense. We have number six, the midfielder. We have number seven, number eight, the strikers. 
I don't know whether I'm, I'm, uh, I'm right or wrong, but <laughs> praise be to God. I'm not a fan of football, but at least I know something about the, those positions. So, they embrace each other. This is your week. If you take number one to number seven, he may not perform. If you take number five to number two, he may not perform. So you, we embrace you with your, with your challenges, with your weaknesses, with your shortcomings, with your strong points. We are there to embrace each other. For us to be united, we must embrace each other. And number two, for us to be united, to, to separate socially, then we must complement each other. When I talk about complementing each other, I'm talking about let me put it in layman's language. Them that have known me by now, I'm a preacher who preaches in layman's language. I'm not that complicated. So when I talk about complimenting each other, it is coming through for each other. Coming through for each other. You have this weakness. There is this gap. You come with your strength and fill the gap. We don't expose each other. We don't laugh at each other. We don't compete with each other. Again, when I'm talk talking to couples, this is what I do using my figures. That this is me, this is my wife, this is my chairman, this is my secretary, this is my whatever, this is the other. When we come together as a team, as a family, as a couple, when we come together as a church, you came with your strong point, the five figures. You came with your strong point. And in between the figures, the spaces that you see, they are your weaknesses, your failures, and your shortcomings. And you also came with them. Don't think you came like this. No, you came like this, with the strong points and weaknesses. And then when you met me, I am the same. I am with my strong points, I have the weaknesses. When we come together, let's assume we start competing. If we compete, we amplify our weaknesses. It is now wider when we compete with each other. We are not here to compete. Even in the choir, we have the, the four voices. They don't compete. If you are soprano, you are soprano. If you are bass, you are bass. We don't compete. They are there to complement each other. When you are in alto, when you are in like my wife, you are alto. So you find yourself, you are in that choir, not to compete with the rest, but to complement each other. In a church like this one, we are not here to compete. If you are gifted in music, then go to music. If you are gifted financially, then be in that development committee. If you are gifted in leadership, then lead us. We are here to compliment each other. Even back at home, can you compliment each other? In that office, can we compliment each other? For us to remain united, we must embrace each other and we must compliment each other. Because this is what we need for uh, social stability. And in most places, you find people that are not united. You find people that are no, not as one, as, our, as the Bible told us about um, uh, the body parts. That the body parts, they, each, they need each other. They work as a team. Where the feet, where the body needs to go, the feet takes it there. If you need to take someone with your heart, the legs will take you there. The ears will listen. The eyes will see for the whole body. So we are here to embrace each other, and we are also here to team up as a group and work together as a group. As we, as we wind up, the last point for us to stable socially, it is interaction. How do we interact? Because of, as I have said, after showing love to each other, after being united, then we need to interact. We need to interact. Because when we interact, we are enhancing our boards. We are coming together as a team. And when we talk about interaction, it is reaching each other. And we can only do this in two ways. The first way 
it is humility. How humble are you? Imagine God himself. I don't know whether it is Philippians. It should be chapter 2. Chapter 2, maybe from verse 9. It talks about Jesus who abandoned, you know, he abandoned, you know, the godliness and came down in a human form. That is humility to interact with us here. And I always tell people the birth of Christ, the birth of Christ, which we celebrate on Christmas, the birth of Christ brought God to man. But the death of Christ, which we are about to celebrate, it took man to God. The birth of Christ brought God to man. And the death of Christ took man to God. So it took humility for Christ to be a human being, for him to walk on earth and live in earth and live like men. It took humility. The opposite of humility is pride. And I always tell people, when we say you are proud, we mean you are full of yourself. You can never interact well with other people when you are full of yourself. You will never stabilize socially if you are proud and full of yourself. If we, young, we have young people in the house, this is one of the major problems they have. So proud to interact with others and they miss so many opportunities. You know, so proud that you miss opportunity. By the, by the way, when we talk about spiritual maturity, that one is immaturity. Because not, one, not everyone who is asking your neighbor is after your love or after having an affair with you. But you need to be humble. Second Corinthians, this should be chapter 7 and verse 2. The Bible says, Paul is telling the Corinthians, 7, 2 Corinthians 7, 2, make a room for us in you. Make a room, because you have a room in us. Make a room for us in you. You as a person, as a family, make a room for others. Interact well. If it is Mother's Union, you are here as a department. Can you interact with other mothers in the deanery? Can you interact with other mothers in the archdeaconry? Can you interact with other mothers in the diocesan level? If it is St. Paul family, can you interact with other people at the Asian level? Interact. We need others. We need to, come to, 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 to interact with other people through humility. And that is why you see when an, old, an older person is talking with a younger person or a small child, you bend your head, you incline your ear to listen to them because you humble to hear. And I always tell people that where God has put you, some of us where God, where God has put us, people cannot access there. It is us to come down where they are. You need to hear that again. Some of us where God has put us, people cannot reach you unless you humble yourself. Even Jesus, we could not access him up there. It took him it costed them him humility to come down and interact with mere men. What about you? Can you humble yourself so that you can interact with others? If you read the book of 2 Kings, it should, it should be chapter 4 and verse 3, 2 Kings 4, 3. It talks about a certain woman who was indebted and then the husband died and left that bill behind. And that is when, I, when I'm teaching men in the year seminar, I tell them that we pray unto God that at the end of our lives, we will not leave bill behind, but will. It's a difference between leaving behind a bill and a will. So this husband died leaving bill. And then the wife went to Elisha. And Elisha sent her back to her neighborhood. And this is what Elisha said. Go to the people you live with Ask as many vessels as you can. It takes you humility to go door by door, door to door, asking for vessels. Kama alikuwa mama mjauri na mama marigo, 
Angepoa na nani hizo vessels? Nilisikia mama mwingine ni tajiri ati alisema simu yake amefuta wa mama wote maskini. Amebakisha watano wa kutoa miji. Such people do exist. <laughs> that is how some of us we are poor in interaction. Another one who was a prominent in this diocese, I won't mention where. She could not interact with other women. You know when someone dies in a village set up, they go there in that locality, they used to go with five bob and then the sukumawiki and then the firewood. I don't know what 50 bob, 50 bob, sukumawiki and the firewood. Everyone uh, who has got uh, who is mourning, they could visit that family. Every woman in that village, they could go with firewood, 50 bob and the skuma. This woman was untouchable. This woman was so proud, he could not interact with people. So what he, she used to do, she used to give a thousand at every homestead. What wakikufa napatia nagiri, napatia nagiri. Her time came and the husband died. Every woman said, poor or rich, we are going to gang up as a team. And we are even going to help those who are not, who do not have a thousand. We are going to take a thousand each to that woman. Iyo giri aiwezi karibisha wageni. Iyo giri aiwezi pika. Iyo giri aiwezi obaleza na wewe. Wakati ilipata giri zimejaa kwake. A certain friend came to her and told her, you need to apologize to the village. Because the, inter the interaction is very poor. Her social stability is wanting. And then she went door to door saying, sorry, forgive me. Take back your 1,000. Sorry, forgive me. After uh, returning every money to those women, then the woman ganged up again. And they went with 50 shillings, nyeni naruko. 50 shillings, nyeni naruko. That is how social life is. It is not about who you are in the society. It is not about what you have. It is about how you relate with people. I had a certain bishop. By the grace of, by the grace of God, I've interacted with like six bishops in Kenya. One of the bishops told us, when he was leaving his house, you know, outside the, uh, the, uh, the uh, gate, along the road, there is a certain woman there with a kibada. And so that, uh, that bishop would drive out, maybe with a driver or himself, then he could drive out without saying hi for some months. And then one day, this woman stood at the road and he stopped bishop. And bishop now roared the, 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 is it the widow or the grass? You know? <laughs> and then the wife, approached, this woman approached the bishop. Bishop. You know you pray for us. You are bishop of a certain church. Even though, even though I'm not your member, at least you are, you, are, you are a leader in the church of Christ. Why don't you even one day stop, stop here and say hi or even pray for my kibada? Bishop was so ashamed. He felt so guilty that he could not interact with this woman. And she, she, he got out of his car, prayed with this woman, and did some shopping from that kibada and then from that day he could make I uh, could make sure that every time he says hi to that woman it cost you nothing to say hi to interact with your you, with your workers to interact with those people who are your neighbors to interact how do you interact with them and that is why you see even uh, at barrios those people who are dead and those people who really give themselves in that process of that burial are the people you socialized with. Because social life is so important. For you to stabilize in this life, to stabilize as a family, work on your interaction. And finally, after humility, then you interact with kindness. Kindness is a state of being friendly or generous. A state of being friendly or generous. You need to be kind. Someone who is kind is socially stable. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for reminding me this. There are two people in the Bible, and we know them. One of them is Lazarus. I thank God because Lazarus is the book of John 11. And the other one I'm, I'm about to talk, to, to talk about is the book of Acts. So they are well planned in the Bible. 
John 11 talks about Lazarus. When he died, even before Jesus came, he died, and the Bible says he got sick, and then he died, and then he was buried. Immediately he died. You know what they used to do? They used to bury someone, and then they continue with mourning. Nowadays, we mourn fast for seven days, and then we bury him. At that time, they could bury and then continue mourning. That is why when Jesus got into the house, uh, into that homestead, he found them mourning. And the Bible says, when, G when Lazarus died, immediately he was taken to the tomb. Look at the second scenario, Acts chapter 9. A woman called Tabitha and Dorcas. Dorcas stroked Tabitha. When she died, she died the same death as Lazarus. But instead of the neighbors, the social, instead of them taking her to the womb, they took her to the upper room. Can you see the difference? This is a social life. Kuna wegina wanakufa, tunasikia tunaitaji kuwazika haraka sana wadoe shida. No one misses you. They want you to be buried as fast. Ata unasikia kwa watu wakisema, ataziku ziku walini? Tuesday. Because Tabitha had social impact. The Bible says when Peter got there, if you read Acts 9, it should be 39. When Peter got there, the widows were there holding the clothing that Tabitha would give them. And, and they said, this woman used to give this cross to the needy. He used to give this to the widows. So the social network, because of our kind nature, it was so stable. How stable are you socially? Ask yourself, how stable are you? Am I in love? Do I forgive and persevere? Ask yourself, am I in unity? Do I embrace and compliment each other? And ask yourself, am I interacting well? Are you interacting well in humility and in kindness? God bless you.